everybody, I'm Maritza Barone, and this is the Things You Can't Unhear podcast. Has there ever been a moment in your life where you heard or read or were told something that you simply could not unhear? Something that caused you to make positive changes so that you could become the best version of yourself? Well, we share this show with access to inspiring and empowering humans who will motivate you to become the happiest, healthiest, kindest, and most compassionate you. Sit back, settle in, and let this be the day you hear something that simply cannot be unheard. Well, hello. Welcome back to Things You Can't Unhear. What will we hear today that we cannot unhear? Well, I've invited the very insightful Kelly Schultz to the show. She's the head of brand communications and culture for Belong, which is part of the Telstra organization. Kelly was born with a genetic eye condition and she's been legally blind from birth. Today, she shares her life and career experiences and her realizations about herself growing from an innocent child to a very aware adult. She's now a successful woman in business who is pioneering change in diversity and inclusion and teaching others that they can do better to be more inclusive by getting comfortable with their own discomfort and by asking the right questions that will guide them on how they can help others who may identify living with a disability. During this chat, Kelly and I also discuss the new and existing technologies that can enable people living with a disability to have an even playing field in the workspace and useful information for recruiters and employers who may want to build on their diversity and inclusion practices. Kelly has built a wonderful career for herself that she's very proud of and rightfully so, as she's also helped many others to take positive steps towards their own careers without feeling different or held back. I loved chatting to Kelly. I actually really learned a lot during this conversation and I hope that you will too. Let me know what you found to be the most interesting takeaway from this chat on the Things You Can't Unhear Instagram community page. And also don't forget to link people to this episode who you think might benefit from it. Thank you for clicking play again and enjoy this episode with Kelly Schultz. Welcome, Kelly, to the Things You Can't Unhear podcast. How are you today? I am very well today, although I am in cloudy Melbourne and I have to say it's the first time I'm feeling a little bit cold this bit year. Chilly. So. so how did you start your day today? I started the day at about six o'clock this morning and get out before the sun rises to take my uh, my guide dog for a walk so that she gets some some interesting things in interesting things to smell before the day starts. Oh, that's um, and I'm working from home today. So um, a bit of a relaxing start after that. Yeah. Amazing. Tell me about your guide dog. What's her name? Her name is Velvet. She is black velvet. Uh, she's four and she loves being a dog, very much loves being a dog but will absolutely be an amazing guide dog when there's uh, treats involved. So <laughs> definitely know what her motivations are in life. You know what? It's a bit, a bit of balance between work and play, hey? We're all like that. Well, I like to get paid for my work too, so I can't, can't blame her really. <laughs> exactly right. Well, thank you for sharing that. Now, you are the head of brand and marketing at Belong, Telstra's challenger brand, and have a quite a significant team behind you. So tell me a little bit about your role there and sort of a bit about your career journey, if you can, because I want to talk today about not only women in business, but also diversity and inclusion and people who are pioneering change, which is what you are all about. Uh, I love your journey and I can't wait to share it with everyone here today. I have, I love my role. I have a a role that encompasses both brand and culture for Belong. So I actually get to do all the external facing stuff. That's the really fun stuff that everyone gets to see prospective customers and everyone out in the world, but also have that impact on our people as well, because really a brand is both the internal and the external. And I think bringing the two together to, so that our people are experiencing our brand in the same way. And we're all so living our values. So it, it makes it that what you say is actually what you do 
And I think that's quite unique in uh, for some businesses where what they say might be one thing, but how they do it internally is something different. So my role is everything from big radio ads and TV and the fun stuff that's that's out there to, you know, the internal, how our values match with what we do every day and how we work. Amazing. Well, you've just definitely had a, a wonderful career journey. Uh, where did it all start? I want to know about your employment history because, for those who don't know, you have a genetic eye condition. So you were born legally blind from birth. You did have an interesting commencement into employment, didn't you? I did. I did. I was quite naive, um, I think. I'd grown up believing that I could do whatever I wanted to do. I mean, my career aspirations to be a Formula One driver were never probably going to come true um, mm-hmm. and still haven't. Um, I think I've I've... I've gotten over that now (laughs) Um, and thought that I'd just go out there like anyone else, apply for jobs that interested me, that matched skills that I had. And that wouldn't be an issue Um, that, that my eyesight wasn't a thing. It was, it was something that I knew how to overcome. So surely everyone else knew that that wasn't going to be a barrier for me, but getting out into the world and, and applying for jobs, it just didn't happen like that. Just didn't happen. I, applied I was doing a lot of applications going through some recruiting agencies and those sorts of things the the recruiting agencies seem quite positive but I not understand now from having had a career that recruiting agencies get paid for putting people in places so they're going to be enthusiastic and want to put as many people out there as possible and the one of the first ones that I got further down the interview line with was everything seemed positive. We did a tour of the office with a few other people who were interviewing at the time, did the group interviews. It was actually quite a long and involved process. And we got to the end effectively to the job offer to the, to the point where I had forms in my hand that were to fill in your bank details. Effectively. It's like you're basically starting this job with bank details. And one of the interview panel stepped out and pulled me aside from a couple of other people who were looking to get a job at the, looking for the same sort of job. I think they were hiring multiple people at a time and said, we've just been chatting and, and you really are the best person for the job. We, we can, we can totally understand how you're the best person for the job, but we can't give it to you because we don't think we can make it work with your vision impairment. Mm. Wow. And to think now that someone could say that with a straight face blows me away. Uh, But at the time, I had no strategies for overcoming that because I hadn't experienced that type of sentiment before. And it's, it's just a devastating point. I think you go into shock when something like that happens, when you don't know how to deal with it. And I I walked out of that building. I held it together until I walked out of the building and it's, It's that thing that I just didn't think was going to be an issue. Mm. I knew it was hard for me, but I didn't think it would be hard for everybody else. It's uh, that, that rejection for that, that thing that I can't change that thing that I can't, I can't, doesn't matter how hard I try. I'm not going to be able to see any more than I can. Um, It it was overwhelming. It was overwhelming. It's actually one of those times where I can, can say that my faith was restored in humanity. I was clearly distressed um, in floods of tears sitting somewhere not far from that building. And actually a member of the public came and asked if I was okay or needed any help because I was so clearly distressed and in public. Um, Thank you. I don't know who that gentleman was and it was a very, very long time ago, but um, you know, that that's, that's how distressing it was. And, and once you move on from that, it it becomes anger. So that whole change process becomes, that processing becomes anger yeah but then you start to go well what do I do with that do I actually want a job in an organization where they don't want me if I take them on if I choose to battle that particular point what what outcome do I want I want them to be better at it I don't necessarily want the job because you've already told me I'm the best person for the job, but you're not giving it to me. I don't want to go into that environment. Why would I put myself into that environment? And so I, I never actually did anything with it, except be really determined that I wasn't going to let anyone 
do that to me again. Yeah, absolutely. And you don't strike me as someone who is going to take no for an answer or just leave things at that. You strike me as someone who's going to get up again and and try harder and create the change within these organizations to do better and not say that to people and have them break down and and experience what you did. So from there, what were, what were your next steps? I mean, you obviously collected collected yourself after feeling almost a cycle of grief that and realizations that you had and so then how did you first gain employment into a position that you now love it was definitely through being really clear about what I could do and what would and would and wouldn't impact me and I think that's one of the one of the real lessons is that people don't know what they don't know Mm. and that's that's okay. And people make assumptions, but actually challenging those assumptions is something that I do need to do. I do need to be open about going, Hey, this is this kind of work. This is computer work, or this is, you know, whatever work it is. I will do this by X, Y, Z. This is how I will do that. Um, And it's even to the point of interviews and, you know, I've had many jobs (laughs) in, in my career. um, And one of my most one of my favorite interview questions when, when they say in an interview of, is there anything you'd like to say or anything you'd like to add? One of the questions I ask at that point is so quite obviously uh, I can't see, I have vision impairment or I'm blind. What questions do you have about how that works? Because I want people to be put it out there and go, actually, I don't understand how you do that. How do you do that? Or you're giving people the in to be able to ask questions because they don't know what they don't know. And so I took, I took it on to make sure that both the recruiters who I was working with, but then also prospective employers understood that I could do this, that I could do that job, yeah, uh, whatever it was. And so I did, I did go for an interview with, with Telstra. And it also showed me that those people who'd gone before me with various challenges had also paved the way. At the time, I I was being really emphatic with the person interviewing saying, are you sure? Because you know what? I I don't want to be in the same situation I have been previously. Are you absolutely sure that this, um, that we're going to make this work? And she said to me, there's a guy upstairs with no arms. I think you'll be fine. Mm. And so to me is that that person with a disability who would have no idea that they were being used <laughs> in that way mm. had clearly shown the capability of people before me, before I got there. Yeah, wow. And that has sat with me for a long time to, to say that that's also my responsibility. That's my responsibility to the people who are coming after me as well to know that, I can do it and I have proved it to all those people who I've worked with and maybe that will be why someone else gets an opportunity. 100%. Yeah, and it's obviously been a number of years since this happened because you've been working with this company for a long period of time. Uh, Do you feel as though there's been improvement within diversity policies uh, within organisations and companies these days in Australia or do you still feel like there's a lot of work to do? I think the policies have come a very long way. Has the practical application of those policies come a long way? Not as far as I think the policies would make us believe. I think the reality for people is very different to what the policies would have you um, believe. How can things be better from your opinion? Uh, it's it's people. So it's humans. It's always It always comes down to people um, and people having that fear of the unknown and fear of asking questions and fear of getting it wrong. Um, There are lots of advocates out there who do a great job of shining a light on things, but don't necessarily do a great job of making it a safe place for people to ask questions and making it a safe place for people to, um, to know about things that they don't know. Um, And I think things, things like um, TV shows, like you can't ask that, um, have done a great deal to help those sorts of things, to, to get those questions out there that might seem obvious or might seem silly, but people don't know. Mm. And I think what people can do better is sort of get comfortable with their own discomfort and say, okay, 
I'm going to ask this question because I don't know. And I'm, I'm comfortable if I get it wrong because you don't know. And that's the only way we can get better. What are some of the frequently asked questions that you get and that you're actually okay with? You know, my frequently asked questions are generally about my dog because she gets way more attention than I do. So they're (laughs) the first one Um, about me. It's often people want to know. So how much can you see? Yeah, that's, that's one of the frequently asked questions. And it's a question I can't actually answer because I don't have a frame of reference. Mm. I don't understand the experience of how anyone else sees. Um, It's kind of like asking a fish about water. Um, I don't know that a fish would be able to describe water or how we describe air. Like I, I don't know how to describe how much I can see because I, or what I can see because I don't really know. <laughs> and it's very much, it's very contextual for me. Um, so that's one of the most common questions. I think the curiosity, the, the checking your curiosity is, is one of the interesting things rather than how much you can see it's, it's what can I do to help? You know, so often you hear people talk about wonder why that person's using a wheelchair, for example. It's like, is that really any of your business? Mm. You know, some, there are some questions that you kind of go, is that a bit more personal than you should probably be asking? Maybe think about how you can help or how you can actually be making sure that life is accessible to them as you possibly can. That's sort of one of the things on question without trying to discourage people from wanting to learn also just be careful what you want to learn about, make sure that it is actually relevant to your level of experience and and what you want to, how you can help. Yeah. And I think having these conversations is so helpful to people who are in that position and do want to help and don't know the questions to ask. And and hearing it from you today really helps people um, get into their comfort zone as well with asking the right questions and and being the right support if it's needed because it may not even be needed. (laughs) Oh, and that's the funniest times, right? The the times where someone assumes that if you're standing on a street corner with a dog, um, that you want to cross the road. Um, no, I might be standing on a street corner waiting for someone or trying to figure out which direction I do want to go. But assuming that I want to cross the road and, and you know, manhandling someone to help them across the road because that's your, that's your good deed for the day might make you feel good. But it's really annoying for me because I didn't want to cross the road. <laughs> just, just, just ask. Asking is the best policy. Ask, how can I help? Do you need help? Um, and don't be offended if the answer is not nah, I'm all good thank you for asking <laughs> yeah, yeah that's a really good one that's a really good one I do want to link back to the workplace what do you think are the hiring managers biggest barriers uh, when it comes to employing people with a disability I think it's the biggest barriers we all have and it's those unconscious biases mm. um, and I think so part of it is is understanding so Um, you know, I've sat in rooms with people who go, but blind people don't use the internet. How do they use the internet? It's like, oh, God, let me, let me tell you, (laughs) let's start from the beginning or making assumptions about um, making, almost making assumptions and decisions on people's behalf to say, oh, I think that would be challenging for them. Therefore I won't ask, or I won't, I won't hire them because I think this workplace would be hard for them to get around. Mm. Well, Mm. that's not, a reason not to employ someone <laughs> that's a reason to change what you do or actually ask them how would they do it and so assumptions are one of by unconscious bias things where you might be deciding something on someone else's behalf also hiring managers want to make it as easy for themselves as possible um, and I understand that I've I'm a I've been a hiring manager I know what that's like you want a seamless process that doesn't require someone who's quote unquote needy but there's nothing to indicate that someone with a disability is going to be needy. Everyone is needy. In my experience as a people leader, everyone is needy. Absolutely. <laughs> it, um, and, and that's where we need to change some of the narrative. Um, nothing is more condescending than um, the idea of having to accommodate someone with a disability. Mm. What accommodations do you need? you don't need to accommodate me. That is not, that is nothing more patronizing than that. Mm. Um, And so for hiring managers, and it's, it's going to be unconscious bias about everything. It's going to be about women. It's going to be about 
race and gender and disability and whether you're a parent or not. And I think changing that narrative on that idea that why is it only women that need flexible working arrangements? That is such a gendered idea that that women are the ones who are probably still the caregivers at ho- in the household and doing far more um, far more unpaid work hours than than the men in the household. Yep. It's a, it's an assumption that's just not true. Yeah, yeah, totally, and still happening. <laughs> Is uh, has there been and still some, happening? Yeah, has there been some new tech technology that's really helped you recent in recent times? Oh, technology is one of my favorite things. I love technology. Technology is amazing. Um, I would first say though that technology, we assume that technology is a good thing and that all technology is somehow an advancement, but that's just not true either because humans create technology. We're still in this position where we as humans program that stuff, we design it, we, we're responsible for it and therefore it comes with all the flaws and biases and assumptions of humans. Um, And so technology is a really interesting one. Um, I think for me, the humble smartphone with all of the things that are available on it now, most people, there's there's an app out there. I'm not sure if a shameless plug of an app, it's a Microsoft app. So, you know, they're big enough already. Um, it's a great one for parties. You can, it's, it's about identifying things. It'll identify a scene. It'll identify wow. people, what you're looking at. It'll read text. It'll read barcodes. It'll to tell you what color things are. It will tell you what currency you're holding in various countries. Um, but one of the entertaining things it does is if you take a photo of a person, it will tell you, um, you know, man in his man about 47 looking happy and so it ages people and people are it's like a competition now to see how old this app thinks you are i need to have a play with that what was the name of it uh, it's called seeing ai oh, i love <laughs> and it's, it uh, yeah. it's a great app it's a great yeah. app for that just does all sorts of things um really helpful things uh, but one of the most entertaining is is aging people <laughs> yeah we're gonna have a bit of fun with that at some point I think no there is tech that we you know, many of us have a love love hate relationship with technology and I think that in these situations it's just um, revolutionary to people's lives so so important but it's like you said people have created these to solve problems and and make our lives better. So that it's definitely doing that. I love that you shared that. What about technology at work? Is there is there tech at work that has been really helpful in your progression? Um, I think just that tech is available to do everything we need it to do. Um, it, it's connecting people. So technology, I mean, even the technology we're using right now to connect us means that mm. I haven't had to figure out to travel somewhere to yeah uh, you know and all the logistics that are involved in that in a place that I haven't been before with you know all of the things that are challenging about that are taken away by technology and we can have this conversation and record a podcast like it just sort of it's a bit mind-blowing for you know I'm sure even you know 2005 me would be absolutely amazed by where things are at now from that perspective so I think the technology that we use every day is absolutely enabling um, and enables me to have that <clears throat> even playing field. Yeah. Um, it's a, it is equalizing in that way. And do you use sound? My curiosity is coming now. So do you use sound technology to, uh, to read from computer screens? Yep. There's all sorts of things, screen readers um, and text to voice uh, applications, a lot of which are now native in all the technology you buy. But that's one of the things you don't know it's there because you don't need to use it. But mm. thankfully for people who do need to use it, these things are inbuilt in a lot of most technology now is um, is quite accessible and quite accessible out of the box uh, without the need for lots of, lots of extra stuff. So yeah, the, the technology advancements, even in the last few years are quite significant on that front. 
Brilliant. Well, I want to get to know you a little bit more on a deeper level. And, you know, having this conversation about what you've done in your career is great, but I really want to share who you are at the core a little bit. And I have a company called Conscious Conversations, and we create these conversation starter cards, and I've got them right here in front of me, actually. Uh, And I pulled two out earlier, just before you came on. And so would you mind if I asked you two of these questions? Go for it. Excellent. All right. So the first one I pulled out was, what are you most proud of? I am most proud of what I've been able to achieve in life compared to the expectations that I felt were were sort of there most of my life. And I think I'm proud of that from both the expectations perspective, but also compared to anyone. Um, And I'm reminded of that by my peers, um, the people in my team, quite often I I'm really proud of being able to build a career uh that I have but also that that has made a difference to to other people and hopefully I've left them and some part of um the world better than I found it oh that is so beautiful and you should be proud this next question is if you really really knew me you would know that finish that sentence my favorite color is shiny <laughs> and and that's a both a physical color if shiny but also yeah. metaphorical shiny things yeah. i love being curious about all the things that are shiny in the world um new things things that are oh look at that over there because it's just sort of popped up so um it's a little bit distracted by and my own curiosity at times i think is what that really means um but also love anything that's shiny yeah yeah and I think that's a great thing because you're really paying to uh, paying attention to what pops up in front of you and not just got the blinkers on and and heading in one direction it's so nice to just be aware of new things that arise and and what they can do for your life uh there's one well there's one more you know what I'm going to chuck one more in because I'm loving these answers (laughs) what aspect of your personality do you think adds the most value to the world I think it's the the ability to see things from a slightly different angle from perhaps what other people were thinking and to present that back and to mirror that back in a way that might be a little unexpected, maybe a bit direct, uh, but always with a bit of bit of uh, humor on the side. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's the piece of feedback that is very often reflected back to me. Um, that people appreciate and value. Um, And it's definitely been something that has helped my career or has helped who I have become by being able to see those slightly off-centre nuances of something and to call those out without being afraid to, um, but also doing it in a way that people feel like they've learnt something. Um, Yeah. And I think you've done that quite a bit throughout this conversation as well, which has been really helpful. And yeah, you, I can sense a little wicked sense of humor in there too. <laughs> oh, apparently I have an evil laugh. <laughs> <laughs> so if you weren't doing what you were doing today, working with Intelstra and, and doing the amazing change work that you are doing there, what else would you be doing? What are some of your other big passions? I think it would be very similar wherever I go, because I think it is it is about um making a difference, just making, improving things for people, even if it's just one person that hears something, sees something, experiences something that, that makes a difference. Um, I think that's what it's about. We, we see humanity as one big thing, but it is made up of all of our individual experiences and the, the better we can, the more we can raise the bar on those experiences for as many people as possible, for as many individuals as possible, the better I think our society becomes. I know that I can't tackle some of the really big things, but I can tackle some of the smaller things that are going to make a difference to that one person who, you know, it's really cliche, might be prime minister one day. Who knows? Who knows where that person's going to go if they just get that little bit of something that makes a difference to them 
And these small things may be very well be big things to others. Exactly. Um, you don't, you can't classify that by your own judgment. Um, and so making an experience or something better for, for an individual um, can make all the difference. And that's the basis of the work I do now as well. Um, even some of the little things like making something more accessible or adding audio descriptions to, to TV ads, you know, that's, that's just something that I make us do but there are going to be a couple of people out there who see that and appreciate that for the first time. And that makes a difference to them. That makes a difference that someone cares. It makes a difference that they can experience something the same as someone else can. And they're not, they're not big scheme, big things in my scheme of things, but they may be for other people. Yeah. I love that. Thank you, Kelly. Now you have been listening to my podcast You've told me you've uh, you, you've gotten <laughs> to know me before coming on the show, which I absolutely love and I appreciate. So thank you. So you know that I ask everyone this question at the end of the episodes. So hopefully you're a little prepared for this one. But what is something that you have heard in the past that you could not unhear and that forced you to make or sparked positive changes within you? The biggest thing for me, and there are so many, right? Like I, it's a, it's an open question that I could go on for hours about, but I know we don't have that much time. I think the biggest thing was when I started in my, my path of being more of an advocate and being comfortable to be out there and, and talking to people and, and making this kind of difference that I've been talking about. I was looking for a hook. I was looking for something that would help me describe it. And it was actually Maya Angelou's, uh, a quote that is, um, do what you do until you know better. And then when you know better, do better. Mm. Mm. And then the notion of that for me, it's, is really about when you know better, do better. You're allowed to be, you're allowed to make mistakes but don't let your ego get in the way of then doing better and admitting that, okay, now I know something else. That whole curiosity for learning and wanting to know more and wanting to do better is what we should be about. It's what, it's what everyone, it's what I aim to do. So think it, don't be afraid to have an opinion one day that you've changed the next because you've learned something new. There's nothing wrong with changing your opinions or changing the way you view something or changing the way you think about something, because that means you've learned more. That's a good thing. And don't let anybody tell you that you need to apologize for that or to criticize you for changing your mind. Well, I've changed my mind because I'm smarter. <laughs> That's a good thing. Yeah. And I think it's come up a lot over the last couple of years in the way we've dealt with, with COVID. Honestly, like there's been a lot of criticism. Well, you didn't say that last week. Well, we didn't know that last week. Mm -hmm. So actually know better, do better. It's, it's, a, it's a fundamental and really easy to understand way of, of doing more and, and doing better. Mm, that's a good one, Kelly. Curiosity. I think we all need to become more curious, like you said, and, you know, people can get stuck in their ways and their own thoughts and, and their own, they've got this set of knowledge and they think they know and, and then they, they don't grow any further than that. And, you know, even having the courage to say, hey, I, I was probably wrong all those times back then, but I feel as though I've educated myself and empowered myself with much more knowledge and stood in the shoes of others where I can now see more clearly from a different perspective and another perspective other than just my own because the perspective can change significantly from where you're standing, right? Absolutely. And that's the thing to be proud of. That's the thing to be proud of is that you are growing and learning. That's, uh, I don't, that's, you know, I, I see a lot of judgment for that sort of thing in the world and, and on um, our friend social media, but don't judge people for, change, for, for getting a better perspective on life. Yep. I love that. And I think it's a beautiful way to end this conversation, Kelly. You're an intriguing woman and I'm so glad to have had you on the show and have taught us uh, so many things today about your life, but also about being more inclusive and, and knowing the right questions to ask and, and, and igniting that curiosity within ourselves, which is so incredibly important. Thank you so much for having me. It's a privilege. Thanks for listening to the show. What did you think? And what did you feel? 
Let us know by leaving me a message on the Things You Can't Unhear Instagram community page. And if you can, give us some ratings love on your favourite listening platform. 